Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about life through the prism of food. And this week we're off to North Macedonia via Crawley with Spasia Dinkovsky. I ached for her as a kid because we were so close and she loved me so much and I think it always pained her that we were so far away. Spasia's book, Doma, meaning home, is one of my favourite journeys back to where it all began. She may have been born in Crawley, but her heart, she finds out through her cooking and her writing, is with the women who fed her soul in Macedonian summers. Already spotted as an Observer Food Monthly's rising star, she took an Instagram lockdown hobby and turned it into a supper club and then a shop in South London called Mystic Burek. The book is a story of a second generation immigrant inspired like so many writers who come in this show and onto my How to Cook a Book writing retreats by her grandmother, her baba. I asked her if the road she travelled back to North Macedonia was in search of who she really was. Absolutely. I think I've been travelling that road for a very long time. Obviously, it's a hot topic with second generation people that you struggle to find your place between two homes. Uh, I did a lot of that growing up and I think I shied away from my foreignness at school for obvious reasons um, and pushed it back a lot. And now I'm at a place where I feel so confident with my voice on the subject that I regret all of those years I wasted where I didn't ask enough questions, specifically when it comes to food, um, and didn't pay enough attention. Uh, I feel like I'm making up for it now, but it's definitely something I live in regret and I would encourage other third culture kids to really embrace it as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, it really is fascinating because, it's, of course, those stories, those oral traditions... They don't, because you're relying on people and people, unfortunately, they do pass on. And that is what's happened. But you have you have managed to kind of go back and, and talk to lots and lots of people and pull all those stories together until you've created a really sort of lovely legacy to, in honour of your grandmother and all of those who, who have since passed away. We can tell very clearly that even though you are Macedonian, you're actually born in Crawley. <laughs> <laughs> you lived in New York, you summered in the Balkans, but you are a Macedonian woman running a mystic burek shop down in, in South London and you're all about everything that is a mashup from the Balkans to Crawley and everything in between. Tell me what that feels like. What does it taste like for you? <laughs> what does it taste like? It tastes like all of my life experiences thrown into a pie, to be honest. And I think a mashup is a good way of describing it. I think that's probably a concept that people are wary of a lot of people seek to define culture and it can be quite boring, really, because, you know, everyone's experience is completely different, especially someone like me. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of pour all of that life experience into the food that I cook, which is probably the best way to showcase what it's like to be me. And I know a lot of people that can relate to that, which is also great. I've experienced that a lot with having the shop now. Because obviously before I was running my business and talking about all of these things on social media and finding people to connect with. But it's so different when someone comes into the shop, says, oh, you know, at first they'll be a bit shy. Then they'll start seeing all the different Balkan memorabilia everywhere. And oh, like, oh, wow, taking pictures. I recognize this. And then I'll start a conversation. Where are you from? Oh, my mum and dad are Macedonian. And then it opens up a whole new connection. And that's probably been the most precious part of the whole experience. But, you know, it, you use the word boring. I mean, it's the least boring thing in the world because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so many people who've talked about it on this show. Um, I, I always use Gerd Loyal as the, as the kind of the king of, of third culture food um, because what he did is he raised that conversation. He said, it's OK to be whoever you are. And a lot of people have found permission through what he's done with Mother Tongue. Um, but gosh, I mean, you know, the very first one I did was way back when I was doing the Delicious podcast with um, Olia Hercules, you know, and it was only by being away from Ukraine that she realised that that's, there was an ache that she needed to kind of cook her way back to. She then went through the supper clubs exactly the same way you did, realised that people love your food and yeah. wanted to find out about the story. I mean, that's pretty much what happened to you, isn't it? I mean, trace a little bit about that. Yeah, I started my business, obviously, with the Bureks, um and baking them at home and delivering them and arranging collection points. But it was definitely through 
the supper clubs that I started to gain more traction from, or at least I think I started to gain a crowd that really understood what I was trying to do, where it wasn't just a pie that was being delivered to your house. So again, that opened up a whole new conversation and people coming up to me after they'd eaten the food and telling me what they thought and how it kind of opened their interest in the Balkans which is exactly what I want to do I might not be prescriptive and traditional but I just want to start that interest in people because I think it's still a very undiscovered part of the world Um, and it's such a beautiful culture that I want to shout about Um, so yeah through cooking I definitely yeah found my voice really I know that's quite a common thing to say but it really like you know food is the connector and understanding how people eat in a region is to understand the culture. I mean, actually, it's not a common thing at all. I mean, I do food writing retreats here and there's a lot of people who try to find their voice and it's Um, extraordinarily powerful when they do. There are tears all round. I mean, it is about the most profound thing that you can do. Um, You know, finding your roots through your food and then finding the voice to be able to say it is the most precious thing isn't it because you know you're holding the hands of people who've gone before you you're you're really kind of finding who you are through all of those your ancestors i mean it's the story of lots of people that you are telling here um you told a lot of people that story on instagram first how important was instagram to your entrepreneurial side It was integral to the whole process. And it's not something that I ever banked on. I didn't really use it before. And it was just by sharing these pictures of the pies that I started to gain more followers. And I was like, oh, there's something in this. This is, it feels like a community. I think it's definitely feeling a little bit less like that as time goes on, which is a bit sad. It's becoming a bit more, I don't want to say superficial, but there's definitely... I think we, I mean, obviously I started this during COVID times as well. So everyone was thirsty for food. (laughs) It was just a pure obsession, wasn't it? And I think people were definitely more keen to really invest in small businesses and invest in people and their stories. So it all worked out perfectly timing wise. Um, But it, it still very much is that for me. I try to kind of ignore the noise and focus on, being vocal and honest and open just to draw other people in with similar views. Um, So I really love it for that. I've created a nice little community around me, which has been great. Fantastic. And now, of course, you've got the shop. Um, uh, So you've got absolutely everything that a publisher would be looking for. You've got the the next big story to be told. The un... It's always about secret kitchens, isn't it? You know, sort of the Claudia Claudia Roden and the Elizabeth David and the Jane Griggsons and the Elizabeth Luards, they all talked about these secret... Well, they were not secret kitchens. They were just unknown kitchens. So uh, publishers are always looking for the next place that is untold. But it was untold to you as well. I mean, it was... It was food that you grew up on, obviously, but, you know, you grew up in Crawley. So you actually had to make that journey yourself. Going through your four food moments takes you on that journey. I mean, how does it feel seeing it in a book? And how does it feel as we sort of start to talk about going back into the Balkans? Does it feel foreign to you? The book has given me so much and not just a voice, but... a a true connection to my culture and to the country itself. I used to, you know, I've always gone there quite regularly, but it never really felt like mine because I, as much as I'm fluent in Macedonian, I speak with a very heavy British accent, as I've been told, I would never notice it. But um, yeah, I always felt like I was going with my parents and I was in their place. It wasn't mine. But through the book and by going out there so much on my own, it really feels like home now to me and I have this newfound confidence in being there and speaking the language and doing so much research, connecting to the food and, yeah, it just, it, 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 honestly, like, the book has changed everything for me. Now when I look through it, it feels very heavy with emotion and uh, all the different, you know, it's a very big experience to go through there's a lot of work to it and you go through so much personally doing it that it just it feels very weighty in my Mm. hands in a way that it probably didn't feel at first no no not at all I didn't really know what I was doing at the beginning to be honest I obviously had a book proposal but that's that's just a proposal that's just a general idea of what you're going to do it it really develops as you go Um, I had no idea what to expect it wasn't really anything I thought I would end up doing. I just kind of went for it. Yeah. 
I mean, it's interesting when you you talk about, um, you know, your accent. I hear this a lot as well. You know, people brought up in this country go back to the 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 country of their parents or their grandparents, and they feel like a foreigner in their own land. Um, you talk about ordering a beer in in your accent, and you're worried about being seen as a foreigner. I mean, that's such an interesting feeling. You're from your your Macedonian, but you're a British Macedonian, and people did pick up on your on your accent, didn't they? What did they say to you? Did they say welcome back, or what was the conversation? Uh, I'll generally get someone just saying, "Oh, where are you from?" Or like, where, you know, they they're like a bit confused, like you're you're speaking fluently, but it's not quite right. Um, or I'll just miss a word or say the wrong thing. Or and people love it, and especially when I start talking about what I'm up to here, it just blows their mind. Um, you know, someone selling burak in London, it's just, and then I tell them that actually I'm not making traditional burak, and they're like, "What?" You know, um, and yeah, I've had a really good response um, from everyone over there. But yeah, it it definitely was a struggle when I was younger. I just felt, yeah, I just didn't really feel like I fit in in any way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the burek that you you make is, um, we would know it's burek or borek. Uh, it's a hand rolled pie, traditionally with choice of meat, cheese or spinach. And you use harissa butter, wild garlic, lamb, sausage, confit, spring onion and apricots. Your mum, it was your mum who said you'll never tr- truly belong anywhere unless you understand your roots and find your own way to appreciate them what does she say about the coffee spring onions though <laughs> when I first started I think in terms of flavors my mum was the most supportive uh my mum and dad know I can cook and you know trust in what I do but it was quite a struggle with a lot of the elder generation my aunties just yeah like not they just couldn't wrap their heads around it like what are you up to um but yeah mum's always been really supportive and like very I mean you can see by that quote she's very encouraging and uh yeah deeply connected to what I do how wonderful yeah let's have a look at what the Balkans what Macedonia looks like I I have a sense because I've been to Slovenia which was all once upon a time Yugoslavia I went on a fantastic press trip to Hisha Franco which at the time was one of the best restaurants in the world and Slovenia felt to me as we were traveling around for two days with a couple of other journalists and Walter Kramer who is Anna Rush's husband so we were going around the kind of farms that you write about the dairy farms in particular it's 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 that kind of small holder culture. We went up to the hills and the dairy farms that you talk about making this young white cheese. Tell me what it looks like in Macedonia. The easiest way to describe it, obviously, it's a very small country. And then you have the um, capital city, which is Skopje, which is surrounded by mountains. And within these mountains is where you'll find the farms. So that's what I've always, well, or not always. I've only really, like I said, like writing this book has opened my eyes up in a completely different manner and the fact that you can drive out 15 20 minutes out of the city and find yourself in a completely different world is what I love about Macedonia it really does have a bit of everything so if you want to stick to the city you can but then you you, it really isn't far to go to find a farm such as this goat farm um and small farming is still very integral to our culture and it's very different to the way it's done here. Obviously here, we're now paying a premium to have quality, small batch foods, dairy, produce, where it's the absolute opposite there. That's the cheap stuff. And you go to the supermarket if you want to buy a bougie parmesan that's been imported. I love that. And that's that. I think that's what's kept it going because if you're smart you're going to drive out to the farm and buy something and yes that's, that's the, also the person that knows how to eat and how to cook um so that yeah that's what I really love about it let's start with your first food moment now I have literally no idea how to pronounce a lot of this stuff so forgive me so Slatko Tikva this is all about your baba your grandmother yeah yes so yeah it's Slatko is pretty much any fruit that's preserved in a very thick syrup. Um, Slatko literally means sweet. Um, And you make it to traditionally be served when a a guest comes to your home. Uh, And it will always kind of be put out on a tray in a little dish. And it could be watermelon rinds, which is the recipe for in the book, or uh, tikva is squash or pumpkin. 
um, you know, grapes, or kind of any fruit that can withhold being preserved in a jar, you'll do it with. And the idea is that when someone comes to your home, you serve them something sweet to sweeten their experience of coming to see you. And you will serve it with a little glass of water to refresh you because obviously it's so sweet, you need to kind of wash that away. Um, and I just think that's so special and it really just sums up us as a people that we are just so obsessed with hospitality. Um, and I named the book Doma, which means home, not just to refer to obviously Macedonia being my second home or my home or however you want to define it, but also because everything's just about making people feel like they're at home. Yeah. And your Baba brought this a tub, a five kilogram t- a plastic tub yeah. of, of slatkots when you were born. I mean, it wouldn't be allowed. No, I know. <laughs> I think about this a lot and obviously did as I was writing the book and kind of staying in a flat every time I went to Macedonia. I think there's obviously going to be a really special connection with someone you want to be really close to, but you're not. They're always really far away. So I had this image of her that was so specific and I ached for her as a kid because we were so close and she loved me so much and I think it always pained her that we were so far away always made a very big deal out of that every time we saw her there would just be floods of tears for hours on end just to show how much you know she missed us and loved us and she was great she was just a great laugh to be honest I had the kind of right attitude to life um very much about enjoying herself, relaxing and eating and eating really well. And food was a real obsession with her. Um, and we bonded over that. We bonded over snacking together in the middle of the night or making something we shouldn't, like pasta at three o'clock in the morning or whatever. That was our thing. And she always had a big box of biscuits wherever she sat next to her. And yeah, it was just, yeah, I just kind of loved her way of living, really, and loving yeah. And you would go and stay with her, presumably when you had your summers in Macedonia, which is your second food moment, the, your, your mum's courgette. Yeah. Now, again, your bubble would have been around at this time, wouldn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, definitely. It was it was a kind of group effort to do the cooking. Um, I call them mum's courgettes, but they're not technically my mum's recipe. They're just my mum's courgettes to me because she always makes them in summer. Um, and it's actually a really common way of cooking any vegetable specifically in summer frying them off and then drenching them in vinegar garlic and parsley a common kind of flavor triangle in the Balkans um and I just have so many memories of my mum standing by the frying pan and just carefully frying each courgette slice to perfection and then popping it on some greasy paper on a plate and everyone just waiting for lunch and buzzing around her and yeah it's just such a simple dish but it's it's just perfect. Yeah, it sums up those those summer kind of picnics as well and long tables and lots of people around that. And that is what this book is, is really about. It's about the food and the people and particularly the matriarchs, the women in in your uh, family. And your third food moment is Great Aunt Sue's and the sour cherry baklava. Presumably that was on the long table as well. Always on the long table. It was always on her table for sure. You knew you were getting that when you went over dinner. Everyone's kind of anxious and waiting for dessert to come out. Um, and again, it's not technically her recipe. She didn't create it, but everyone in the family knows that that's hers. There's been a few little arguments over it other people claiming it but it's definitely hers um and that dish has just as soon as I started making it after she taught me um I started making it back here at pop-ups and it just really took off and now it's a staple at the shop I mean baklava is interesting isn't it because it feels much more of a Middle Eastern dish Balkans is a is a, such an interesting place geographically isn't it it's such a such a in many ways it feels very inaccessible through the language um, yet very accessible through a lot of the foods we recognize you know that syrupy slatka uh, the courgettes obviously we know very well but baklava we really know but sour cherry has a, a very sort of eastern med kind of feel about it doesn't it yeah I mean a lot of the food in Macedonia is you know left over from the Ottoman Empire because yeah. we lived under that rule for over 500 years so there's a it's really obvious um, and specifically in Skopje in the capital there's a old bazaar that you just feel like you're stepping back in time and it's very Turkish um, and you'll find lots of things drenched in syrup which is great uh, but yeah sour cherries 
cherries in general are just so integral to our cooking um but yeah it's a wonderful dish <laughs> yeah gibanitsa 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 yeah gibanitsa is your fourth food moment um this is pie isn't it this is this is what you are all about um although you do make the paklava in in the shop don't you you make all of this in in, in the shop do you? i make a version of it so i've actually come up with a sour cherry bun so made in the same way but rolled in the pastry and then it's topped with whipped cream cheese and drenched in sour cherry syrup yeah they're very popular they sell out pretty quickly yeah um Givanitsa was was what sparked the idea for Mystic Borek, your, your shop. But t- tell us about that. Tell us about the shop. So, it, it, you know, it was during COVID when everyone, everything stood still and you had time to think. And obviously it just brought up a lot of memories for me and wondering when I could go back to Macedonia next and thinking about my nan and thinking about everyone over there. And I'd, I'd, I was handed, um, well, her recipe book was handed down to me, but I just struggled to open it. Just too scared to <laughs> go there, really. Uh, but during COVID, I had no excuse. So I opened it up, saw the recipe for Gabanita, and just thought, you know what, I just need to make this and get it out of my system. Cried a lot when I ate it. Um, and then, again, with so much time on my hands, I thought, what, you know, what can I do with this? Are there other ingredients that I can put into this pastry that would work? So I just started experimenting, um, and that kicked off the whole business. But... I think, yeah, I don't really want to say that nothing, you know, none of what I make will come close to that. But there's even following a recipe down to a tea, it just would never taste like hers. Um, And I think that's something that I'll always strive for. But then do I want it to? I think maybe that's just nice to have that memory, really. What would she say about this book, your bubba? Oh, God, it's such a shame she's not around for it. That's something I think about all the time when I go back to reread it and, you know, read about her, I just think, I just wish she knew. Um, I think she'd be so proud. She definitely would struggle to understand a lot of it. Um, But yeah, even, you know, she went before I really got to cook for her. So I think that would, that would have been the most precious thing to actually cook some dishes for her from the book. Um, because she probably would have enjoyed them like nobody else. <laughs> a lot of my food writers who come to the retreats start with the grandmother. Really? Um, in fact, yeah. And I do a thing called Second Helpings on uh, a Zoom, which is uh, sort of for my Substack paid subscribers, where we revisit some of my guests on Cooking the Books. And last time it was Dina Mackey who wrote Bahari. Uh, and of course, again, same same story, born in Portsmouth, uh, had this yearning for what is this about her Romani Zanzibari culture? And it's all about her Bibi, her grandmother. And we had all the people who were on that Zoom who then get a chance to ask the questions themselves. They were all writers from my writer's retreat. Most of them were channeling the inspiration from their grandmothers. What is it about grandmothers for you? I think it really does come back to not having that person around 24-7, personally for me. And I think that's quite common with a lot of second generation people. You don't necessarily have them to hand. So you do idolise them. Not that they're not worth idolising, because I think she definitely is. But you, you just have this... You're just trying to, like hold on to her in a specific way and I guess yeah through cooking and through recipes is the most kind of honourable way of doing it if that's your memory of her of eating and cooking um but I've noticed it too and that's how I've connected with a lot of people through or just talking about loss in general as you're saying like losing losing those hands the stories all the questions you wish you'd asked at the time you're constantly seeking approval in a way of like honoring them in the best way that you can but I think it's also important to you know as much as that can be a good way to kick off your journey you need to think about yourself in a selfish way too like what you know where are you where is this leading um personally well you do actually talk about the miserable guardians of authenticity and I didn't want to pop your bubba's bubble there but you know you you have moved away from those authentic pies into the kind of the third culture food that you represent is it a mark of being a grown-up actually inhabiting your own home your own doma is that what it's about 
Oh yeah, definitely. It's it's a part of growing up, and even at thirty seven, I'm still growing up. <laughs> that's just it's just how it is. Like you can grow up at any age, you can learn at any age. I think that's the great thing about life. Um, and yeah, it's just I've definitely found a new understanding of myself through this, which is really important to grow and learn. Thanks for listening. Do head to Extra Bites on my Substack to get a taste of Mystic Burek. Aspasia shows us around her magical shop. And I'll see you next week.